welcome to March 2020's episode of Core Talk. This is the third episode of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm Andy, and I'm here with your other host, Patrick. Hello. So this is our recognition episode. Um, we're in the middle of Women's History Month, and we're going to be bringing you some segments featuring some women whose work is securing the future of the Hampton Roads area and beyond. Additionally, last month, uh, right after the podcast aired, we had Engineers Week, and I know that you were live in the uh, celebration for that. And then this week is Flood Awareness Week in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we have a segment about that as well. And uh, this morning, we actually did a signing for the Silver Jackets, which we talk about in that segment. Coming up in our news update, I'll let you know the latest on the people, programs, and projects making it all happen this month. The Corps is prepped for another round of dredging at Rudy Inlet. We'll also tell you about Industry Day at the district for architect engineer firms. The Virginia Silver Jackets are on the move again to fight flooding. And is it really possible to see the forest for the trees? We head in the woods at AP Hell to find out. Stick around. All that straight ahead on Core Talk. Also, this episode will bring you our great places to work. We have some jobs uh, in the hopper ready to look for the right people. So we'll give you all that information. Go down to the show notes. We're going to have all the links down there for you to access. And then I refer back to that information that we have for you. So our first segment on this episode is going to be about our Flood Awareness Week and the Silver Jackets. I had the chance to sit down with our Chief of Floodplain Management Services section, Michelle Hamer, as well as Kristen Owen with the Department of Conservation and Recreation for Virginia. Um, They are actually the co-chairs for the Silver Jackets, and we had a great discussion about what you can do uh, to prepare for flooding, uh, flood insurance, as well as what is exactly the Silver Jackets. And all those items, they have a ton of links in there that they talk about. We have all those items in our show notes, so be sure to check those out. So this week is Virginia Flood Awareness Week, and on the program to talk about being aware of flooding and the risks that are associated with it is Kristen Owen with the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation and Michelle Hamer, our Chief of Floodplain Management Services section. Welcome to Core Talk. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So let, let, let's just get into it a little bit and talk about what exactly is Flood Awareness Week. So Flood Awareness Week is a week that we've designated in the state to educate the public about flood risk in Virginia and ways that they can mitigate that flood risk. So we have different types of flood risk in the state. We have coastal flooding in the east, we have riverine flooding, we have urban flooding. So we just want Virginians to be aware of flood risk and how they can be aware of that risk, ways that they can mitigate it, um, ways that they can mitigate the risk to their structures, but also be aware of different flooding like on roads, things that might impact their commutes. So that's why we're, we're doing it, to bring awareness. And for a lot of the folks in, in Virginia who may be you know, not really right next to the water's edge, especially if you're talking about coastal, a little bit inland and stuff. What is the risks to to those folks? So really anywhere it can rain, it can flood. Um, We do have floodplain maps that are produced by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, that each of our localities have. Those are the flood zones that you usually hear about, but flooding isn't limited just to that mapped area. So anywhere it can rain, it can flood. Um, It may even just be flooding from a light a light rainstorm. It might be from high tide, or it could even just be, you know, from a pipe bursting or something and causing water to be on the road. So everyone should be aware of of the flood risk that's in their community. One thing that may be shocking to some citizens is that they could say, well, I live in the city and I don't live immediately adjacent to the water. What is my flood risk, right? Well, specifically in the Hampton Roads area, we have such a low flat terrain that the flooding can actually travel further inland that some people may be aware of. So even though they're not immediately adjacent to water, we want them to be aware of their flood risk. Mm -hmm. And where can uh, folks go to actually find out their risks? So in Virginia, we have the Virginia Flood Risk Information System, or VFRIS. This is available through the DCR website. You can Google VFRIS, and it will be the first few options that come up. And then we'll also provide the link um, to that. But that will show you the the floodplain maps, so you'll be able to find out if you're in a flood zone. 
Uh, but then you can also use other tools from, from different agencies to learn about other flood risk. Um, your locality may have information on stormwater uh, flooding that you might have. There are different uh, tools like Tidewatch through the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. So if you live in coastal Virginia, their, their tool um, is online as well through the Adaptive VA portal, and you can learn about the tides, where they're at, and projected flooding. Um, some of our communities have inundation mapping, which Michelle helped with through our Silver Jackets team. So the city of Franklin, they have inundation mapping, so you can see based on storms coming in where flooding may occur. Um, and then, you know, talking to your local emergency managers or your local floodplain administrators, they might have areas that they know of where it floods. Uh, but also just being aware, you know, if you've lived in a community for a while, you might know of streets or areas that flood frequently um, that maybe aren't in a flood zone, you know, that are mapped. For the inundation mapping, we're really working on that through the Virginia Silver Jackets with different localities. We are working on uh, inundation mapping for the Roanoke um, area, and we are also looking at the Rappahannock River in the area of Fredericksburg. And why the inundation mapping is important is a flood warning will come out, and you you know that there's a risk, but you may not understand the context of that risk. So by having the inundation mapping, you can transpose that into an image, and that image can help you make choices for your personal risk uh, in commuting or even in your structure, knowing what you should do to reduce risk to yourself and to your um, your uh, structure. And so for those who don't know, I mean, we've, we've thrown out the term silver jackets. What exactly is silver jackets? Well, Patrick, I'm so glad that you asked about that. So Silver Jackets is a Corps of Engineers program with the idea that there are multiple uh, federal and state agencies that work with flood risk, but we each have our own authorities and guidelines and programs. And what better way to reduce risk but to bring all that together, all that knowledge, that data, and money, important, um, to bring together to reduce flood risk. And the whole idea for Silver Jackets is that each state has a team and the state will lead that team to um, funnel that money towards the priorities for each state. And if I'm a private citizen, what can I do to reduce my risk? So there are several things that you could do. Um, the, the best way probably to mitigate your flood risk is to have a flood insurance policy. Most homeowners and renters insurance policies don't actually cover flood damage. So if you were flooded and you don't have an individual flood policy, you may not get any coverage from that, which is really important because one inch of water can actually cause up to $25,000 of damage to a house, which isn't something most of us have sitting around in the bank to be able to recover from. So purchasing a flood insurance policy is probably the number one way to mitigate your flood risk. Um, and anyone that's in a national flood insurance program participating community can, is eligible for flood insurance. You don't have to be in a flood plain or a high flood, high risk flood zone to get flood insurance. The cost of flood insurance uh, varies. And so there is this kind of myth that flood insurance is very expensive and in, in some instances it is but you can actually get a flood insurance policy if you're not in a high risk flood zone for about three hundred dollars a year for that premium so it is um, affordable and uh, and so we encourage everyone to get a flood insurance policy there are also other things that you can do just low cost things around your house you know make sure your gutters are clean if you have a, a drainage ditch in your yard make sure it's cleaned out um, try to reduce impervious surfaces, maybe get a rain a rain barrel, uh, things like that. And there's actually a low-cost brochure that FEMA Region 3 created um, that's available online that goes through some of those, so we can provide the link for that as well. And I know we've talked a lot about, um, you know, your personal property and, and, and your house and, and such, but uh, you, and just driving around, what are some ways that you can reduce your risk in driving, especially when you've got flooding going on around you? Patrick, I'm so glad that you asked that. I, I, you think about the Tidewater area and even anywhere around Virginia, and we cross, how many bridges do we cross and don't even think about bridges, or even low areas, In you think of the city of Norfolk and the underpasses where we have railroad crossings. And 
when we have a, a lot of rain, those uh, underpasses fill up so quickly and people will still drive in those areas. They may not be aware how deep that water is. It doesn't take a lot of water to cause a uh, car to float or to flood and they can very quickly find themselves in a situation that would, they would need to be rescued. So we just ask people, um, please be aware of your commute when you're driving around. Think of where things flood or where water pools when it does rain and think of different routes that you could take to work or in your driving around so that if that if it does rain that you can use those alternate routes to avoid areas that flood. Yeah, and it's really important to be aware when you're driving and never drive into floodwaters, um, especially outside of coastal Virginia. The water is it, it is a little different the way it, it works with our roads. And so um, it may look like it's shallow, but it may actually be very deep or the road underneath may not even be there anymore. And many deaths that occur during flooding um, are are in cars where people have been swept away or or trapped and so we really encourage everyone to never drive through water um, the national weather services slogan turn around don't drown is really important many of our communities will put up signs so it's really just paying attention and don't risk it um, as michelle said it doesn't take a lot of water it's actually six inches is enough to cause most cars to stall out um, and and then one foot of water is enough to to move most vehicles so it doesn't take a lot just find a different route if you can um, or change your plans for that day. Don't don't risk it. And today, uh, as we, when the podcast hits the, the streets, uh, we're doing a signing. Can you talk to me a little bit about that, that, that signing? Absolutely. Um, so what we're doing is we are signing the charter for the Virginia Silver Jackets team. Now, 10 years ago, we signed the charter. It was our very first charter. And we since then, as, as does anywhere else, um, the, the players have changed, right? And this is a great time in, in Flood Awareness Week to re-energize our commitment, working together as a team to celebrate the accomplishments that we have done as a team. We helped the uh, city of Richmond um, establish high water marks. We have uh, created a HECRAS model for the James River to help the National Weather Service uh, develop a total water forecast in the city of Richmond at the City Locks Gauge. I'm gonna stop you right there. What is a HECRES model? Oh no, that's a great question. So a HECRES model is how we develop our um, hydraulics for a river. So we model it in a um, spatial um, system to um, model how water flows downstream and we use that to determine uh, water heights. And why that was important for the uh, James River was we were able to translate tide from Norfolk, Virginia, all the way to City Locks Gauge. And that's important because that gauge right there gets uh, riverine flooding, but also is subject to surge flooding when we have a hurricane. So the National Weather Service forecasts a total water level at that point. And also why that's important is that we also have the flood wall in the city of Richmond. So the city of Richmond needs to plan when they're going to sh shut certain gates and having a total water forecast there will help them do that. So that's a couple of the projects that we've done as a team. And so this is just a great time in the middle of Flood Awareness Week to celebrate the things we have accomplished and look forward to the future with a new vigor of working together to reduce flood risk in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I want to say thank you to Kristen Owen and Michelle Hamer once again for joining us on Core Talk. Is there anything else you guys want to add that I may have forgotten to ask? Yes, we would like to share with the listeners that flooding can occur any time during the year. So now is a great time to look at your flood risk when we're not in the middle of a storm. Um, and with that, we'd like to mention that Atlantic season, Atlantic hurricane season, begins June 1st. And hurricane season, it's important to note, it isn't just coastal Virginia that's impacted by that. Um, we've had many of our inland communities get hit with rainstorms and flooding during hurricane season in the past. So we wanna make sure that everyone is aware um, of their flood risk, not just our coastal communities. And also keep in mind, um, for flood insurance, it takes 30 days to a policy to go into effect. So now is the time to be prepared. So we wanna just encourage everybody to go home, check their flood risk, see if they have a flood insurance policy, and if not, 
talk to an insurance agent and see if it's possible to to work that into their life to cover their property. And that goes for homeowners, renters, and businesses. Um, you can get a flood insurance policy to cover all of that. So I want to thank you once again for uh, joining us on Core Talk. There's a lot of great information that was shared. Uh, we will go ahead and put the, those links into the show notes so that it'll be available for everybody who's listening. Uh, Kristen, Michelle, thank you once again. Thank you, Thank you, Patrick. Now, last month, February, we had a little party or a little get-together kind of thing for our uh, National Engineers Week recognition. Uh, the great work of our engineers and all the different roles that our engineers fulfill here in, in the community. Um, it was What was especially cool was talking with Cheryl Fromey, the chief of our engineering and construction division. She's delivering the mission, but also setting standards in equality by being who she is and doing what she does. So I'm here with Zach Ware um, for our Norfolk District National Engineers Week event. How are you doing today, Zach? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, so tell our listeners, um, what is your official job title? Um, I'm a structural engineer um, at, here at the Norfolk District Army Corps of Engineers. Um, you're, yeah. you're new. Er. Yeah, so I think I'm coming up on eight months. So yeah, pretty fresh, pretty green. <laughs> So what is it, um, tell us a little bit about what your, your official job is here at the district. So as a structural design engineer, uh, we typically um, act as the um, designer of record for various uh, MILCON projects and um, on military bases or government sites from a structural standpoint. Gotcha. Uh, now, what does a day in the life, like, okay, so you, you, you're walking into the building, you sit down at your desk, what are you facing that day? So, I mean, that, that, uh, there's so many things that we can do, you know. Um, some days I come in and uh, I pretty much have time to put my stuff down, grab my hard hat and run out to Fort Eustis uh, to a job site for a, uh, a dam inspection, a bridge inspection. Um, some days I'm trudging through emails and RFIs and just various customer emails, correspondence of various types, or I'm just crunching numbers, working through calculations, working in uh, design. I mean, it's all over the place. You name it. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems to be like w talking to, you know, the different people here. That's that that's pretty status quo for the Norfolk District. Like you are not coming in and doing this is not drudgery work. This is not production line. You are doing something different every day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's uh it's highly unpredictable, which can Sometimes be good, sometimes not so much, but uh, it's enjoyable. It's not mundane. It's not just predictable and boring and everything. Definitely not boring here, that's for sure. <laughs> um, now, in your eight months here at the district, what, um, what's a memorable event or a project or a program or just anything in general? What, has, what stands out for you like, that was really cool? So... Um, I was just talking about this earlier today. Um, the first six months or so I was here, I heard Craney Island, Craney Island, Craney Island. Um, never understood what Craney Island was. I thought it was a military base or something. I'm not <laughs> sure. I never heard of it. Um, and recently I got taken out there because I'm going to be working on uh, spill box number one replacement. And I did not know that it's not an island. It's a peninsula. I don't care what anyone tells you. <laughs> um, but it is a site where we dump our dredge uh, material from various dredge projects and it's a continuously sinking hunk of land and I, I just thought it was really cool it sinks about um, on average an inch per year or really? sorry sorry an inch per month sorry about that inch per, oh my gosh my hair doesn't even grow that fast <laughs> there's a peninsula slink sinking yeah. what you gonna do about that <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yeah. <laughs> So I just thought it was really cool that um, they're continuously coming up with ways. Uh, it, there's a lot of standing water in the three cells that they have, and they're trying to come up with ways with draining, draining it. And uh, the drains that we put in are sinking with it. So as this entire mass of land sinks, the drains sink. So we have to come up with ways to pretty much install new drainage that is going to last longer as the entire 
land sinks. I don't this know. is <laughs> like a living project. This is just it's yeah. it, this is a continual project. Interesting. For I think seventy years now, they've been doing this there. Wow! Yeah. Oh my gosh! See, and I just learned something new, and I, I think I, you know, not so much to know it all. <laughs> um, so now, where were you before you came to the district? I worked in the precast uh, concrete industry as a uh, manufacturer. I was in the uh, design and engineering um, department there, and we made uh, precast concrete for various projects all over the East Coast, some in the islands, Dulles Metro Rail, uh, the new Veterans Bridge, so a lot of local and non-local projects. Now, and that's civilian sector? Yeah. So have you had any DOD affiliation before this? Nope, this is my first. Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the team. Um, so, what would you what would you tell like younger folks? Um, I'm just gonna. I'm looking at you, and I'm, I know that's terrible. So, you know, look at somebody make assumptions. But you look young. That's a compliment. It's my face, <laughs> baby face. <laughs> what would you recommend to some younger folks um, who you know have studied? In, now, what was your field of study? Structural engineering. Okay. Uh, what would you recommend to some younger folks who are looking to get into working um, in the federal uh, job circuit as a structural engineer? Um, so first off, um, one of the big things, um, one of the things I found most different when applying for structural and private sector, um, resume. Your resume has to be completely different. With private sector, they want like one, maybe two page, quick, hey, this is what I did, so on and so forth. Um, government, they want lengthy, a lot of details, a lot of everything, so multiple pages. If you have background, um, if you're a student, um, definitely, definitely get in some internships. You're going to need some experience before you, you know, go out, obviously, and the more the better. Um, the engineering field that we work in, it's just continuously growing, um, and you, you can't do enough, you know, to make yourself more and more valuable every day. Experience counts, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming out with us today, talking to our listeners, telling us a little bit about you and your experience here at the Norfolk District. Um, and what we, you know, I am now fascinated with Craney Island, <laughs> or, uh, Craney Peninsula. Craney Peninsula. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna change the name. And so maybe we'll have to have you back and talk a little more about that because sure. I feel like there's, I feel like we're just, we're just kind of that's the veneer. There's a <laughs> lot more to it there. But uh, thanks again. Enjoy National Engineers Week, and uh, you know we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Hello, my name is Keith Butler. I'm a cost engineer at the Army Corps of Engineers, and my uh, work title is a mechanical engineer. So tell us a little bit, what, um, what is your job consist of? What do you guys do? Uh, we get uh, involved in every aspect of the uh, engineering product that we produce, and that is from the beginning of inception of the uh, idea of a project to through construction. And a uh, cost engineer will f provide a snapshot of what a project will cost in the beginning. And as the designers continue to design the product from the 10% uh, to the 30 to the 65 to the 100% design, we give updates on what that uh, what the price is going to be for that product and for that construction and even during the uh, contracting part when they uh, send it out for somebody to bid on we have our estimate of what it's going to cost and then when they bring their bids in from the contractors we compare our cost to to their cost so that's how uh, we uh, take it to that construct that contracting point of awarding the project and if it's close enough to our, the independent government estimate, we'll uh, win that bid. Okay, I, I, that makes sense, I get that. So what, what is a memorable moment in your career or what is a fun part in your career? What kind of stands out that makes us like, this is, a, this is a pretty good place to work, this is a pretty good job? Well, I've only been in cost engineering for a couple of years. So uh, when I first started out, in my uh, uh, engineering career, uh, I was in design for a couple years, and then they needed somebody to go in construction. And so my first uh, jaunt into construction was working on the Virginia Beach Boardwalk. And 
That that's a big that's a big <laughs> yes. So <laughs> that's like a now my yeah, kids baptism say, by fire. Yes, my, my my kids say that I built the Virginia Beach Boardwalk. <laughs> and how many kids can say that their dad did that? That's a that's definitely a feather in the dad cap on that one. Yes, yes, yes. So I have to correct them in the sense that I just oversaw the construction, and that al- allowed me to see the whole process of construction with some high quality uh, contractors and uh, to see so many different aspects of uh, construction. This was all civil construction with a tiny bit of uh, uh, vertical construction with walking through a 10 foot diameter pipe under the boardwalk. It's it's a drain pipe in almost pitch darkness. And, uh, you know, just it, it, it really does give you the perspective of, you know, heavy construction. And and you bring up it's an interesting part about what we do here at the Norfolk District is that the projects we're doing become part of the community in which we live. That boardwalk has that has that Norfolk District castle on it, and that's kind of like your legacy, but also you know your imprint, your footprint as as part of the community. It's so funny that uh, uh, when I was an intern, not even an engineer, working for the Corps of Engineers, uh, I was. Uh, draft. You know, I was uh, working as a student and I was asked by the architects to come and do some, help them with some drafting, some hand lettering. And one of the things that I was uh, asked to do was to draw some of the fish that are imprinted in the concrete on the, uh, on the boardwalk. When I go out there, I see the, the turtles or see the fish and uh, all that things, all the things that I was drawing but did not know I was going to eventually be overseeing the construction on so that's it blows my mind the, the process of being at one point and then jumping in on another point and then last year you know riding on a boardwalk with my children uh in one of those little pedal cars that's so great that is that is like the overall like that's the story that's the story of of you know those of us at the norfolk district so man keith thank you so much for coming out and talking to welcome. us this welcome. was We'll have to, you've got some good stories, I think. We'll have to, like, have a feature on you one of these days. <laughs> well, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks so much again, and uh, we'll be speaking with you soon. Hi, my name is Cheryl Frommy, and I am the Chief of Engineering and Construction Division here at Norfolk District. That was perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay, so, Cheryl, what, um, tell me a little bit about what your job is what do you do so as the chief of engineering construction division here at norfolk district my job is really to provide the resources the innovation the leadership the mentorship the training and the um, abilities and all of the resources for folks to be able to execute their missions from a day-to-day perspective so that they can move forward and deliver the program Okay, so we know your job description and what it all entails. What is, so you walk into work in the morning. Tell me about a day in the life. So a day in the life of the Chief of Engineering Construction Division is actually pretty exciting because you never know what it's going to entail. I may wake up and my day may actually start at 5.30 in the morning with a text or an email that comes through about a problem or an issue that has just occurred. Um, or a meeting that I need to have up at Arlington National Cemetery and so I'm jumping in my car and rushing up. Um, Or I get to have some exciting news that one of our employees and one of our um, our coworkers has passed a professional engineering license or they've become a registered architect. So so a variety of things that I get to experience on a day-to-day basis. Awesome, so every day is a little bit a little exciting. There is not the same thing every day. No, so for example, this morning I was leading a dam safety committee meeting in which we were talking about the Norfolk District Dam Safety Program for not only the dams in which we own and operate, but also some of the dams in which we help support with other DOD agencies. And what are we doing to ensure that we are managing that appropriately and, and providing the 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 correct level of support to deliver those programs. Then I transition to a construction problem that we're having at one of our field sites and I'm engaging with the ACO, the chief of construction branch, and the resident engineers to try and figure out um, what the problem truly is and identify solutions to the problems and what we need to do 
to get a get the project back on track and ensure that we are going to provide that quality product to our customer and user at the end of the day. Sounds like you're the coach and choreographer <laughs> of all things engineering. <laughs> so um, tell me about what's um, a project or um, some a uh, program, something that really stands out to you as like, yes, this is why I do this job. This is why I love it. So I guess I have a couple favorite projects. So um, one of the things that might be different for me than most others here at the district is I actually started off as a co-op student while I was still in college 26 years ago. So I've been at this district for 26 years. So there's a couple different phases of my life I think that I have different, different things that I've had the pleasure of working on that really stand out. One is the first project I ever did kind of as the lead geotechnical engineer, um, Chuck Saunders and myself, actually just the two of us, uh, they said, hey, you know, Walt Island needs to have this uh, new vestibule design and constructed, you two go make it happen. And so we did all of the design analysis, we did all of the design preps, the plans, the specs, uh, put it together, did the acquisition, got the construction contractor on board, did the overseeing of the construction, and um, so that was pretty cool. That was like one of my first um, solo type projects as a, and a real, you know, feeling like I'm a real independent senior level engineer. Um, also had the pleasure of standing up the Navy and Marine Corps Dam Safety Program back in, I think it was like 2005, 2006, and working with them to be able to leverage the enterprise experience with dam safety to be able to help out the Navy since that's not an area of expertise for them. And it was allowed me to really engage the enterprise and really pull from all of USACE's expertise. And we coordinate with all the other districts within the Corps of Engineers to actually uh, do the inspections and to help with recommendations, design analysis, repair analysis. And then probably more recently is Dodia, Dodia Design Center. I helped stand up the Dodia Design Center in which um, we actually support um, and provide the design services for any of the Dodia, any of the Dodia schools on any military installations that are run and operated by Dodia, Dodia worldwide. We have projects in Guam, we have projects over in Japan, projects in Europe, we have a project in Getmo that we're currently working on, um, and uh, Puerto Rico, we did schools in there as well. So it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about just never leaving Norfolk District, but able to have such a impact on a worldwide perspective. So thanks to Cheryl Fromey for closing out that piece and highlighting uh, another aspect of the work that's done here at the district. Uh, we work with so many other agencies. We are not in this alone. Like Cheryl said, you know, we work with NASA, NOAA, and that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And those are just two of the many organizations that we work with. Yeah, we also work with a lot of state agencies as well, uh, Virginia Department of Emergency Management, Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, as you heard with Kristen, as well as... Um, you know, Department of Environmental Quality. So we are really out there with many of the state and federal agencies uh, throughout our, our, our nation uh, working to really develop and plan for uh, the engineering challenges that uh, this nation faces. And that's a perfect segue into how do you join us and get a chance to get involved with our mission. So we're going to uh, roll right into our Great Places to Work segment. So this month, we have three USA Jobs announcements. So we have a realty specialist for our real estate office in the acquisition management and disposal section. This is a GS-12 position here in Norfolk, Virginia, and the announcement closes March 20th. Our second USA Jobs position is the supervisory appraiser for our real estate office. This is a GS-13, and this one closes March 17th. The last one uh, on USA Jobs is what we call interdisciplinary. Um, we're looking for a civil, mechanical, electrical engineer, or architect. This is a GS-14 spot with our engineering and uh, construction division here in Norfolk, Virginia. This one closes out March 24th. All of those positions are available on USA Jobs. That's the Realty Specialist, GS-1112, the Supervisory Appraiser, GS-13, and the Interdisciplinary, GS-14. On USA Jobs, you can find the link to USA Jobs in our show notes. 
We also have uh, multiple openings for direct hire authority positions for pathway student trainees at the district's home office and some field offices at Langley Air Force Base, Fort Eustis, Fort AP Hill, as well as Arlington National Cemetery. Applicants should be current college students or have graduated within the past two years from an accredited four-year engineering or architecture degree program. And this brings us to the other segment that we always have, which is our news segment. And to bring that to us is Vince. Thank you, Patrick. For Core Talk, I'm Vince Little, and here's what's happening around Norfolk District. Architect engineer firms can learn more about IDIQ contracts the district will solicit and award in fiscal 2020 and 21 at a special industry day. The event is scheduled for 3 p.m. March 18th. Registration takes place on Eventbrite. You can also find details on our Facebook page. Norfolk District's navigation team hit Crowden Point in Virginia Beach last month to replace pilings and a floating dock in preparation for more dredging at Rhodey Inlet in 2020. Located at the oceanfront south end, the inlet is a hub for fishing charters, jet skiing, and parasailing every summer. Navy boats also use it to reach the Atlantic Ocean. Army Corps vessels conduct dredging operations in Rhodey Inlet about five times a year. It is performed to remove sediment buildup and allow for safe and unrestricted navigation in the channel. The Virginia Silver Jackets are strengthening their commitment to flood risk reduction and awareness. As part of Virginia Flood Awareness Week, the team of multiple federal and state agencies plan to sign an updated charter. The move gives the group better opportunities to collaborate, share information, and expand its resources. The Virginia Silver Jackets were formed a decade ago. Their upcoming projects include inundation mapping for the Roanoke, Fredericksburg, and Richmond areas. The former Nansamont Ordnance Depot Project's Quarterly Restoration Advisory Board meeting was held March 5th in Suffolk. Community members got updates on shoreline and horseshoe pond remedial actions at this 975-acre formerly used defense site. The World War II era depot sits near Tidewater Community College's old Portsmouth campus. Plans are underway for a public meeting in April focused on horseshoe pond environmental efforts. The Corps of Engineers wants to provide information and have a greater community conversation about work schedules and progress in the area. A date, time, and location will be announced on Norfolk District's website and social media platforms. Meanwhile, at Radford Army Ammunition Plant in southwest Virginia, Norfolk District plans to design and construct a new facility for the controlled incineration of various energetic materials still produced there. The effort took a step forward March 5th when the Corps awarded a $350,000 contract to Strategic Value Solutions, a Missouri-based firm, to prepare a cost estimate and value engineering study for the current design. This energetic waste incinerator would replace the open burning method in use since the 1940s. And finally, check out our homepage for a great feature story on Norfolk District's forestry section. Andrew Willey and Stefan Flores of our real estate office assist installations with forest management and timber sales across the entire North Atlantic Division corridor, from the Canadian border all the way down to North Carolina. There's a very cool video shot by Patrick showing loggers in action, chainsaws and heavy machinery doing their thing at an active timber harvest. Find out what it looks like when a 40-ton logging truck rolls right overhead. You really got to see this to believe it. You can find these stories and more on our website and social media channels. And that's what's happening around Norfolk District. For Core Talk, I'm Vince Little. So since this is our recognition episode, I wanted to point out that this program itself takes a lot of people working together behind the scenes to, to create it and then get it out to our listeners. And honestly, there are too many folks to name everyone. Uh, so we're putting out some appreciation vibes to all of you out there. Uh, you know who you are, who help us make this happen each month. So this is it? We're done? We're, we're, we're done? <laughs> I really? think every month you have that response. I, like, I know, because it's just like it that we get into it, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're time to go. Quick move, man. On to the next thing. <laughs> all right. Well, until next time, this is Court Talk. Court Talk is the official podcast of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Court Talk constitutes permission to use that content as part of the broadcast. Court Talk is recorded at the Norfolk District Headquarters building in Norfolk, Virginia, and is produced by the district's public affairs staff. 